Hi, everyone. Welcome. I think we'll get started since people seem to be filtering in. There is a lot of folks registered for the webinar, but as we know, all our schedules are quite busy, so we'll see who makes it. Um, my name is Tyler Carson. Um, I'm a fellowship advisor here at Grad Fund and a PhD candidate in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Um, I'm joined by my fellow fellowship advisor, Nama, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Nama Shunam, and I'm also a fellowship advisor and also a PhD candidate, but I'm in the education department. Great. Happy so to be here. Um, this you might not have seen this before, but yeah, this is our kind of big um, foray into, you know, discussing fellowship and grant opportunities um, in a larger forum. Um, so we're excited to kind of share the resources that we have. Um, the webinar uh, is being recorded and will eventually be sent out. Um, in the meantime, before we do um, kind of disseminate it, we do need to offload it. I will upload um, the slides so that if you aren't able to stay, because um, I know we have things to get to, uh, you can take a look through those. So I'll put them in the chat. They're a PDF. Um, and feel free to share them with um, whoever you need to share them with. So um, let's jump into things. Um, as again, you're welcome to be on camera, off camera. We ask that you stay muted. Um, any questions or comments that come up during the, the presentation, please um, feel free at any point to throw them into the chat. And we'll try to get to them at the end during a QA. and a um, And with that, let's get started. So the outline we'll be going through for today is just a general introduction to, to begin in terms of like what the funding um, kind of world looks like, um, why you should be consider applying for external funding, um, and then discuss some of our graduate um, services here at Grad Fund that we provide for students. We'll go through some award, uh, four award different opportunities um, that are available for you to apply for. And if those don't fit um, your eligibility or your interest, um, we'll also discuss towards the end a resource that Rutgers um, subscribes to called Pivot where you can look for external um, based funding. Finally, we'll discuss um, a resource that we provide called Grand, Grad Fund Canvas site, um, which you can self-elect to sign up for. And the, the, all of the links in the PDF work. Um, so you should be able to just click on those links and, and it should enroll you. If they don't, just let us know um, either in the chat or you can always um, email us. So why apply for external funding? So some goals, right? Um, you know, sometimes um, master's level students, uh, specifically, many programs don't come with funding, right? Uh, as opposed to PhD programs. So there are some reasons um, to apply for funding. So you gain practice communicating your work and its significance to interdisciplinary non-special audiences, right? So in the academic world, if you're in a professional program, this might be different sometimes, but if we're in a research-based program, Often we are trained to speak to our own peers as opposed to people from outside of our discipline, right? And so when we're writing fellowship applications or grant applications, we often have to do some translational work to explain the significance of our research or our interest beyond just our individual peers, right? So we have to make it both accessible and interesting to the wider academic community and or professional community. We also um, acquire uh, experience crafting application essays. So there, the essays in fellowship writing and grant writing are a kind of genre onto themselves, right? So many of us have experience forming academic essays, research papers, et cetera. Um, when you're pitching kind of your research to someone else and a, a kind of non-specialist audience, um, it becomes important to kind of um, learn this genre, right? You also establish a track record of securing externally based meritorious often awards, right? Um, and this will help you stand out to future employers and funders, right? So um, the kind of old adage that like money follows money, right? That people have invested in your um, research, they see the merit, um, and this will help you stand out to, um, um, as opposed in relationship to your peers, right? Um, you also can gain crucial support for your graduate study and bolster your research and CV. And that's kind of the financial um, benefit, right, that we're all looking for. All right, so the funding landscape. 
So this is a kind of really important thing to note and something um, that um, has to do with our mission. So um, internal versus external is a big distinction, right? So there's internal funding that includes Rucker support, such as funding from your graduate program, right? Um, if you have a TA ship or you're an RA for one of your professors, um, if you have a loan from financial aid, these are all internal based funding sources. External uh, funding includes support from non Rutgers funders, right? So money or support that comes from outside of the university. And so our grad fund, our mission is for is to help you secure externally based funding. We don't work with students to secure internal based funding. Um, we work to, on external based funding applications. And so external funding, there's, uh, this is a wide kind of big landscape and there's different kinds of funding, right? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into determining what kind of awards you can apply for or what you should apply for. Um, so there's things like academic preparation and background. So there might be awards for specific fields of study, um, let's say engineering or um, you know, humanities more broadly. There's your stage of study, right? So, um, you know, at master's level, this this is a specific stage of study, right? You're not um, in a PhD program. Um, there's specific awards for different kinds of careers, right? So awards that might help you transition in, into industry or awards that might fund your research. And there's different awards based on your area of study, right? Um, so that could be a thematic-based award, um, or that could be um, a specific kind of disciplinary award, as I said. There's also different types of um, support. So they'll support different kinds of awards will support different kinds of things, right? So they'll often have specific kind of parameters around them in the way in which you can use them. So there's things called research grants and fellowships, and we'll distinguish between those two in a second. There's writing fellowships. So let's say perhaps you have a thesis um, and some money might go towards your write-up of that, or an award would be based on, um, let's say the best thesis award um, at a master's level. There's often grants um, provided by associations for travel or conference right? Um, funding. There's language study, which we'll discuss today. And there's also specialized kinds of training, let's say like a summer institute where, you know, perhaps you um, gain proficiency in kind of statistics or something where it would be a summer institute and they may provide a grant in order to help defray tuition costs or something like that. All right, so the, the key um, difference between grants and fellowships is really important, right? Um, so grants provide support for research related expenses. Okay, so um, not all master's program have research intensive kind of um, components to them, right? So maybe your program doesn't have uh, a thesis that you need to defend, right? Um, so that you might not want to look for grants then. Um, you may want to then shift your um, perspective or your goals in terms of what you're looking for in funding to fellowships. And so fellowships are often what people are looking for, right, when they come to us, which are larger awards that provide support for living expenses, right? So grants provide support for research-related expenses, and these might include like going to conferences or um, lab equipment or any costs that come up with conducting your research, whereas fellowships support you to actually pursue your course of study and the costs that come up with that, right? Um, beyond just the kind of academic research expenses that you experience during that program. All right, so Nama's gonna take it over from here and talk about some services we offer at CrowdFund. So happy you're all here. So I'm gonna talk about both some services that we offer at GradFund, what we do here at GradFund, and also some things that, we're, that we don't do and where to find those. So just to start off with, so our mission is to help students identify and apply for extramural funding. So this is all of the stuff that Tyler just talked about. And we were founded in the year 2000. And since then we've helped Rutgers graduate students win about a hundred million dollars in external support. So that's pretty awesome. Um, just in general, before I talk about our services, I wanna say 
two quick things that we're not. So we're not, um, we're not financial aid. Um, so we can't help you, you know, get student loans or anything like that. And we're also not um, like a, a career service. You know, if you want to find jobs after your program, um, if you want to do kind of that kind of exploration, um, that would be the place to go for there is the Office of Career Exploration and Success. And I'll drop both financial aid and the Office of Career Exploration and Success into the chat a little bit later um, in case you also want to look at things there. But we are here to help you get extramural funding. And we do that in a few ways. So um, we have a few types of services. So we have individual meetings. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about what those meetings look like in a minute. We run an internal award database that you can get to through the uh, Grad Fund website where you can search for awards. Uh, you, they're usually quite tailored to the kinds of awards that graduate students uh, might be interested in and might be eligible for. We run mentoring programs, so keep an eye out for those. Often we run them in the spring and sometimes in the summer. Um, and basically these are longer sets, kind of like this webinar, but um, longer sets like you register for maybe six weeks or something like that. And once a week you come and we kind of work through applications with you. So from the beginning to the end, um, we'll work through with a group of students how to develop an application, what to pay attention to. Um, and we do workshops and presentations just like this one. And there are a few more coming up in the fall. So keep an eye out for those and we'll be happy to see you in more of them. So in terms of individual meetings, we have a few different kinds and they kind of, basically we can walk you through an entire application um, process. So the beginning, you can come, I mean, you don't have to do them in this, in this order, you can mix and match uh, based on what you need, but just generally you can think about them as being like this. In the beginning, you might wanna come to a planning meeting. Let's say you're not really sure um, what awards you might be eligible for, how to find that kind of information, what to do, and some of that we'll be going over today in this um, webinar, but if you have additional information, then that's the kind of meeting to go to. We'll sit with you, we'll talk with you about um, a lot of the stuff that we've gone over, like the funding landscape, what the options are, what Grad Fund can do, and also how to find awards uh, that fit you. Then let's say you've identified an award. You're, you find an award, you're like, wow, this is a perfect award for me. Um, and you wanna think about how to, how to plan your award, what kinds of things to focus on, what's the process. You can book a help with a funder meeting and we will go over, you know, What's the review process like? What are the documents that you need? Um, what are things that you should pay attention to? Let's say you need a research statement. How could you write that research statement? What are the priorities of the award? So basically we'll go over the entire award with you and make sure you understand the process and help you plan out um, how to prepare your application for that award. Then we have application review meetings. So they're just like what they sound like. They're, we review, portions of your application or the application as a whole. And I recommend coming to a bunch of these and using these um, meetings as guidelines for your own writing. So let's say you know you have an award that is due in, I don't know, a few, a few weeks, um, or let's say in two months, then you came for a help with a funder meeting, you know what you need, and now you can book a few different application review meetings so that you have deadlines to submit documents. You have to submit documents for all of these awards or all of these kinds of meetings two days in advance of the meeting. Um, so you can submit things in all levels. You know, you don't have to be finished with your materials. You can submit, say, one research statement that's in progress. It's just a draft. You're not sure if you're not if you're going in the right direction. Awesome. We can help you with that. Uh, once you have a bunch of things that you have ready, like maybe you have a three different statements or some short answer questions or something like that, you can submit all of them. We can look at whether they come together as a cohesive set. And yeah, again, come early, come often. We're here to help. We won't judge you if you, you know, if it's just a draft, it's much better to come early and make sure you get the support that you need rather than coming two days before the deadline. And then who, who knows like how much you can even change before then. Um, and the other kind of meeting is a post-award meeting. So let's say you received an award. 
awesome. If you want, you can come to us. We can help you figure out, you know, the logistics of getting that award, what to do with it, how to make sure that you're fulfilling all the requirements of the award. Maybe you received two awards and you have to figure out which award you want to take or how to navigate that. So we can we can help with that. And we're also just happy to hear that you won something. And um, so please let us know. Um, in terms of booking appointments, so when you go into your My Rutgers page on your dashboard, there should be a grad fund advising widget um, and you can schedule an advising appointment from there. Um, if you can't see that widget, then you can, on the top right, there should be like a little plus sign. You can just browse widgets, browse grad fund um, and uh, get to us or get the widget through that. Tried all of these things and you, for some reason, still can't schedule or still can't find it, then send us an email. We'll drop our email into the chat in a minute and um, we can help with that. So today we're gonna to go through four award opportunities. We're gonna talk about the National Science Foundation um, graduate program. Um, we're gonna talk about this critical language scholarship program, Born Awards and the Fulbright. These are by far not the only awards that are available. It's just giving you a bigger picture of what awards generally look like, um, what types of awards there might be um, and, and what kinds of things to pay attention to. Today we're sort of we're looking at awards that are mainly geared at U.S. citizens, but don't worry that it'll this information is still useful even if you're not a U.S. citizen. Tyler and I are both international students. We both totally know what that's like. Um, it is tough, but you will still learn from this. You know what kinds of options there are out there, what kinds of things to look out for, what types of materials you'll need, um, and at the end we'll teach you how to find additional awards. Um, with a really interesting database. So stick around even if these four awards aren't exactly what you're looking for. And Tyler's, I think, gonna take it away and talk about the National Science Foundation. Okay. All right, so the first um, award opportunity we're gonna talk about is the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program, which is a mouthful, um, often referred to as the NSF GRFP. All right. So before we kind of jump into the specifics of this award, it's really helpful to understand what is NSF, right? So the NSF is the National Science Foundation, and it's a federal agency which supports fundamental research in all fields of science and engineering. Um, and you can see their research areas here are really broad, right? So um, fundamental research is really important to understand, which we'll discuss in a minute but it can span quite a number of fields, right? So social, behavioral, and economic sciences actually fall within the mission of the National Science Foundation. So even if you're in a field like sociology, um, you might be eligible for this field uh, award. So fundamental research, what it is and what it's not, right? So what it is is research about a basic science topic. And what it's not in relationship to that is research aimed towards a practical end. So if you're working perhaps on an applied topic um, that has health outcomes, that's not a, a fundamental basic science topic for according to the NSF. Um, the second thing that it is, is, is research that results in general knowledge, right? So it's not research geared towards a consumer or medical product. Um, so these are just some key distinctions um, that the NSF makes when determining eligibility for projects that it will fund because there are other institutes or um, national government governmental agencies like the National Institute for Health um, that will fund these other areas. So just important to kind of preface it with that. All right, so the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program, NSF GRFP. So it's an early graduate fellowship um, providing two years of support um, for a research-based master's degree and three years of support for doctoral degrees in STEM or STEM education. And it aims to expand participation of under, underrepresented groups in STEM fields. So, the, so anytime we go for an, looking at an award, we always wanna start with our eligibility, right? Before kind of getting into the application components or anything else, we wanna make sure that we're actually eligible to apply for the award. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time, right? So some basics, about the NSF GRFP eligibility. You need to be a US citizen, be in the last year of undergraduate study, 
or enrolled in the first two years of graduate study. What's important about this is if you're enrolled in the first two years of graduate study, you have never previously applied to the GRFP while enrolled in a graduate degree program. If you applied in undergrad, you can apply once more in your graduate program, um, but you can't uh, have applied well in your graduate program. So let's say you're going into your second year of your master's program, you can't have applied also in the first year. You've never earned a master's or professional degree in any field or completed more than one academic year in a graduate degree granting program. So that means once you finish your master's degree, you can't apply for the NSF GRFP to go into a PhD. If you apply during your master's degree, you can, in the first two years um, of graduate study, you can apply and, and use that towards your PhD, um, but you can't finish your degree and then apply. And again, like you can't have completed more than one academic year in a graduate degree granting program. All right, it's a bit confusing. If you have questions about that, happy to field them in the um, Q&A. So some um, kind of information about the benefits that comes with this award, right? So it's a, uh, it's a two to three year stipend, right? Depending on if you're in your master's or your PhD of $37,000 um, that, that cannot be directly applied to living expenses, right? And then it also comes up with, with up to $12,000 to apply towards tuitions and fees. Um, and it also provides professional development um, to support uh, NSF funded students. So that means like mentoring, um, networking, all these types of things um, would be probably cost, uh, cost shared by the funder, right? To go to these events and stuff. So it comes with some um, application components. Uh, one is a graduate research plan. Um, which is a statement. Um, look out for our um, workshop that's coming up in a couple of weeks on the research statement as a part of our strategic writing proposal workshop. It should have been in the same email that you got um, with this workshop, where we'll discuss, you know, how to actually craft a research statement. Um, so there's a there's a three page, I believe, research statement that um, or plan, as they call it, um, that you need to include in your application. There's also a, a two-page personal relevant background and future goal statement. Um, that's part of the application. You rec it's required that you submit three layers of recommendation from faculty and also academic transcripts. So some deadlines, um, they kind of tier their deadlines so that their application site doesn't crash. Um, if they have one big deadline, um, often it's such a big program that um, students will all log in and try to submit their applications on a deadline and then it crashes. So depending on where you fall, and this will be important when you do um, apply for this program and you're interested, you should come to us and schedule help with the funder because we can look through carefully where your field of study um, falls within these broader categories, right? So there's a life sciences deadline, there's a computer information science and engineering deadline, um, there's a chemistry deadline. So wherever your kind of your research falls primarily is where you want to apply um, and when you'll want to apply. So Nama's gonna uh, walk us through. So again, if you, we can always, um, with any of these awards, I do speed, I am quite speedy. Um, if you have any questions about them, drop them in the chat. Um, we can always, you know, um, expand on them in a help with the funder meeting as Nama discussed where we, um, walk through the actual components of um, the application in much more detail, and then kind of um, look at past profile winners, all these types of things, and really strategically think about how to pitch your research. So there's one award. Um, now we're just going to bounce back and forth between awards, um, and I think now is going to take it from here. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about a Critical Language Scholarship Award. Um, and so the Critical Language Scholarship Award is a summer study abroad program. It's a program that's uh, funded by the US government and it's for US students in all sorts of different fields to study critical languages. So what are critical languages? Critical languages are those languages that are less commonly taught and studied on US campuses. They're really, 
languages that are critical to the US engagement with the world and in some cases US national security and US economic prosperity. So you can tell that this is an award that's like very much in line with US uh, federal interests. And it's to prepare US students to compete in a globalized workforce. Um, these are so there's a whole list of them and because of the basically rarity of these being taught on campuses there are different requirements so some many languages like azerbaijani hindi persian etc you don't need any experience to study them in cases for example in, with respect to arabic korean portuguese and russian you need to at least have studied them for one year and in the case of chinese and japanese you need to have studied them for two years um but basically, you go abroad to learn these um, languages. Um, so this is, as I said, fully funded by the US government, which includes round trip international airfare, any visa fees you might have to pay, um, housing and meals, classroom instruction, a bunch of cultural programming and group trips. So you don't just learn the language, you also learn about the cultural context that you're in. This isn't relevant if you're in a master's program, but in some cases you can get undergraduate academic credit and um, you also might want to check in with your program about whether there's some kind of credit available at the master's level. Um, and then you get a certified like international uh, language test score and a certificate at the end. The students who participate in this, um, whose applications are successful, they participate as a cohort. So they share a weekly schedule, which includes uh, 20 hours of language classes, cultural activities, local excursions, and sometimes weekend overnight group trips. And this is really designed for both cultural gains and, uh, or language gains and cultural immersion. So again, you don't just learn the language, you also learn the broader cultural context. So scholars have a language partner, you learn things about like language, there are like language policies involved. Um, and these cohorts are diverse. So there are undergraduate and graduate students representing all sorts of different types of institutions and regions in the United States. The students who are successful in this have different levels of Testing. expertise with, uh, sorry, if you can um, mute yourself, that would be very helpful. Um, so um, there are different levels of expertise with language and travel. And 40% of the student or over 40% identify as students of colors, uh, students of color and 24% receive uh, Pell Grants uh, for financial aid. So it just, they're really trying to get not just, you know, one like particular, you know, group of student that they're looking for. They really want this to represent the diversity of the American experience. Um, which actually we'll, we'll talk about again later when we talk about the Fulbright. Um, and really students get a bunch of benefits from this. You, first of all, of course, make substantial gains in language skills. This is essentially two semesters worth of coursework and academic credit. And then you get a certain language certificate to demonstrate your progress. So that's really useful. You come out with uh, basically knowing more of another language. Uh, and it'll also advance your career. So many US companies like find it advantageous to have candidates with language skills. Um, and it also helps you build experience in problem solving, adaptability, and other kinds of employable skills. Um, and another kind of benefit is you build these um, international relationships. So it's very immersive. I keep saying this, but it's not just language, it's also cu uh, culture. And you learn to collaborate and communicate with people in cross-cultural settings. So this is particularly useful if you are, you know, hoping to learn about the world beyond what you maybe have experienced so far and learn to understand different people's ways of interacting and knowing and cultures. Um, you also join a network of successful alumni. So these are, you get a bunch of alumni resources um, and events. And they're also, um, this also might open up some eligibility for particular US government jobs. So if you're interested in going into a kind of government job after your master's, this is something to look into. Um, so 
Unfortunately, again, this is only open to US citizens or nationals. Um, but as we've kind of talked about in the chat um, and mentioned earlier, this can kind of give you a sense of what kinds of awards are, are open to people, what is, what is out there. And there are gonna be similar awards uh, for, in, in some cases, there are gonna be similar awards that are open to international students. Um, so just uh, at the end, we'll talk about how to get there or like how to, um, how to find those. You have to be enrolled in a degree granting program at a US based institution. So if you're here, you are at Rutgers, so you've already got that. You have to be 18 years old by uh, May 15th, 2022, or probably in the next round by um, 2023. Um, strong candidates. So it's not open to just one discipline. You Like any discipline you come from can give you an advantage. Even if you're like, oh, I'm not in a language discipline or something like that, don't worry. You can still um, be a strong um, candidate. Um, and candidates come from all backgrounds, are interested in basically representing the US abroad. So that can be, you know, the US is a huge and diverse place. And so you can just represent, you know, your corner of the US, your particular experience. Um, in terms of how to succeed. So you want to go through the website and also ideally come talk to us. We'll do a help with a funder. You want to make sure that you you want to demonstrate you understand the, pro, uh, the program and you're prepared to succeed. You want to show that you're excited, you're motivated um, to begin or continue learning a critical language. And make a clear connection between the target language and your future career plan. So, you know, I really like languages. And one of the reasons that, that I learn languages is because I think they're cool. I think it's fun but that's not enough for this program. You have to say why you're actually interested in learning this particular language and um, how that's going to kind of feed into your future career plans. Um, so to do that, um, do the research to connect the career path you're on to one of these languages or cultures. Um, there is a critical language scholarship application video, so you should do that. And you know, this is where Rutgers, this is where Grad Fund can help you with. So talk with us. Um, and ideally, if you have an advisor, talk with your advisor. Um, and also as you're writing, come to us, um, you know, for application support, but also you can go to the writing center if you need help with things like proofreading or particular language help. Um, and and just basically plan how to apply in advance and take your time to work on it behind, I'll say this, I'm sure again, but behind every great writer and behind every great application are lots of editors. So don't worry if you're not exactly sure how to apply right from the get go, you'll, you'll get there, it's a process. Um, so the application is open now. You apply for only one language, so not for a specific country or site, it's uh, language oriented. And in terms of application materials, you're going to have to give um, unofficial transcripts, a recommendation form, which should be uh, usually from your advisor. Um, there are going to be four short answer essays. The website will have more information there and a personal statement. And again, please do come see us with uh, for application reviews. We can help you make sure that you're writing in a way that's clear, in a way that uh, meets all of the goals of the program. I'm sounding like a broken record, but I do I do think it helps. Um, and as of when we prepared these slides, the deadline um, hadn't been announced for this year, uh, but do check back um, to on their website uh, to get the exact deadline. Uh, so, but typically the deadline is in November. Usually the recommendation letter deadline is also around November. Around late January, you will find out if you're a semi-finalist. And when you, um, if you are a finalist, you'll find out in March. And the programs begin in June. And I also wanna say, I, I believe Tyler might've mentioned this earlier, this is a similar timeline as a lot of different fellowships. You know, the applications are due in the fall. You find out in the, sometime in the spring if you receive the award and the awards begin. So in this case, it begins in June because it's a summer fellowship, but often they begin in the following September. And Tyler's gonna take it away and talk about the Boren Awards. All right, thanks. And um, 
I know we can't get out to all of the Q&A. We're trying our best um, as just two of us here. So um, if we don't get to your question immediately in the chat, we'll get to it towards the end in our Q&A session. All right, um, feel free to keep dropping your questions in. We appreciate it. Um, so we're going to talk about another language award um, uh, and then discuss an award that doesn't have to do with language after this. So if you're not interested in language, that's okay. Just bear with us for a moment. Um, so this is uh, another award funded by the government. It's called um, a Born Award, uh, and it's funded by the uh, Institute of International Education, or it's administered by them, sorry, and it's funded by the National Security Education Program. All right, so just again, I we always start here with eligibility. Um, U.S. citizen, um, you're planning to study a foreign language intensively in an eligible world region. All right, so um, the Born Awards have um, strategic kind of selection of which countries um, are pertinent to U.S. interests um, for language study, and those don't include Western Europe, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. Um, you need to be matriculated at an accredited US, U.S. institution or applying to graduate school. So that means that you're a student now or that you've applied to graduate student, and that you critically not... A, you're non a non-citizen of the destination country, right? So if you're an Indian citizen who came to the US for graduate school and you want to go back to India to study a, a language, that's that's not within their eligibility eligibility criteria, unfortunately. All right, so the uh, selection criteria. So um, you need to explain the relevance of of the country, language, and their field of study to U.S. national security. So again, it's funded um, with the security um, mission. So what is the kind of the importance culturally, um, economically, from a security standpoint of understanding that language, right? Um, you also um, need to understand um, the broad range of public policy issues that can be analyzed in terms of US national security and foreign affairs. And it should make an argument that will be detailed and specific and related to your academic interests and professional goals. So unlike the critical language scholarship, which really is this immersive experience for you to um, learn the language and be immersed in the culture, this award has more specific kind of research interests attached to its mission um, to fund people or students um, that, that align with this security mission, right? So um, there's a kind of more, um, a more fine-tuned kind of emphasis here on the alignment between your research interests and your language study. Um, what's also important is that this, these awards have a public service component. component. So um, born award alumni commit to working for the US federal government for at least one year. Um, preference is for applicants who can demonstrate longer term commitment to government career. So if you've worked in any aspect of government service, um, they do prefer that. Um, and importantly, educational deferments of service uh, are available to awards um, per, awardees pursuing subsequent academic degree. So if after your master's degree, you were to pursue, pursue a, a PhD, um, then um, you would be able to defer that service component until after you're done the PhD. All right, so um, more selection criteria. You need to demonstrate a serious commitment to language study before, during, and after the Born Award. Um, you select a program that ma maximize opportunities for language immersion overseas. You set realistic expectations for proficiency gains. Um, and what's important is that language proficiency is not required for future career goals, right? So your language proficiency should be aligned to, um, and you should be able to articulate it in terms of your research interests, but that no, one, no way or shape or form um, kind of has to align with your with your future uh, career goals. All right, so there's two types of eligible programs. Um, there's the flagship language initiatives, and these are African languages, um, Indonesian, South Asian languages, and Turkish. And then there's self-identified programs. So that would be um, ones that you, know, you self-elect. 
um, and that you can convey uh, significance in terms of the US um, security interests. Um, so the language initiatives are available to all le levels. They're fully funded and credit bearing. So again, you get academic credit for these. They're intensive, small class study experiences. Um, there there's, uh, can be a summer course at a US uni university. Um, and then there's a fall course at overseas institution, uh, plus a local homestay. And then there's also an optional um, self-identified spring course overseas component. So it's a big kind of commitment. Um, and there's also what's important is that there's no, um, and this asterisk at the bottom, um, profic minimum proficiency, um, as Nama described before in the critical language, some of these um, languages sometimes have prior study requirements, um, except for French, which just only requires intermediate to high uh, proficiency. All right. Um, so the actual benefits of this award, right? Um, so the self-identified program maximum awards, um, they range, right, depending on your course of study. So if you elect to do um, that fall and spring semester, um, including the summer, it's $25,000 for 25 to 52 weeks of study or $12,500 for 12 to 24 weeks of uh, study. Um, and um, there's also uh, for an emphasis, slight emphasis on STEM with these these awards. So just watch out for that. All right. Um, so it does have a, a budget component. Um, so you have a round trip ticket, right? Um, all of your program tuition and materials, um, overseas medical insurance. Uh, lodging, food, et cetera, transportation, visa and visa related travel, but it doesn't cover passports, right? So if you need to renew, et cetera, your vaccinations, dependents, right? So if you have children, personal travel or entertainment. So if you're traveling within the country or um, within the region, beyond the country, it doesn't cover those, those expenses. So the application deadline has been released for this year and it's January 25th, 2023. Um, and it's for these national deadlines are for study that will begin after June 4th, 2023 and before March 1st, 2024. All right, and now I was gonna take us through the Fulbright um, program. So the Fulbright program, I, I'm excited to talk to talk about this because I've been actually meeting with a lot of people about it. This is something that, so this year, it might be a little bit of a stretch because actually um, we'll talk about it in a second, but the deadline is sort of right now, sort of coming up, um, but it's really something to look forward to um, particularly next year because this is a really interesting award. So this is administered by uh, the IAE organization and it's funded by the US Department of State. It provides grants for individually designed research projects to facilitate cultural exchange, um, direct, specifically through direct interaction um, in the classroom, the field, um, at home, and in routine tasks. So basically, it helps you gain appreciation of other people's viewpoints and beliefs across the world, and um, also for other people to learn about you and the US. Um, and also, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but this is, um, I'm specifically going to be talking about the Fulbright U.S. student program for U.S. students to go to other countries, but you might also want to check out if you're an international student, there might be options um, from basically for you to be funded by Fulbright to go here, uh, to come to the U.S. Um, or all kinds of other exchanges. So I would just uh, take a look at the Fulbright website, even if this particular award isn't the right one for you. I'm... Uh, okay, so the competition is now open um, and uh, there's a website, I'll drop the link in the chat in a little bit, or maybe Tyler will drop the link in a bit. Um, and so here are the eligibility requirements. So um, as I said earlier, and I'll talk about this um, in a sec, uh, you have to be a US citizen for this. Um, just one second. Um, are there Fulbright, or also, I see a question about the chat. 
this in the chat, we'll get to that in a second. But so anyway, so you have to be a US citizen. You have to be able to demonstrate a capacity for independent work. Um, and you also need a general knowledge of the history, culture, and current events of the countries of your, that you're applying for. Some countries have a language requirement um, for going to that country, and it is going to be very country specific. So some countries require um, for you to be, you know, have advanced proficiency in the local language or the national language of the country or in one of the multiple national languages. Um, and some countries only require very beginner um, language. So, so there's a, a huge range. And I would just strongly recommend looking at the, like, you know, if you have a, if you have a country that you're specifically interested in going to, don't worry yet if you're, if you feel like your language skills aren't, you know, super proficient. Um, take a look at their website, there are going to be some options. And you also need to be able to demonstrate a sufficient co uh, competency to complete your project and adjust to life in the host country. So they want to make sure that, you know, they want to support you and make sure that you're prepared to do this. You're not just, you know, you know, fantasizing about a place that's not realistic. You have to kind of show that you have an understanding of both what the country is going to be like, you're prepared to go there, and that you have an understanding of your project and that it's realistic and feasible. So these are not required pieces, but in terms of preferred candidates, um, they prefer that you've not held a Fulbright grant, that you haven't resided or studied in the country that you're applying to for more than six months. Um, they prefer that you had most of your higher education primarily in the United States. And uh, they prefer that um, you haven't had extensive experience in the coast uh, in the host country recently. However, these are not requirements. They're just they they are preferences, um, and there are ways to you know support your application even if one of these or some of these aren't the case. You know, for example, um, maybe you in the host country a while ago um, and for more than six months, but now you're coming back. So it's not necessarily you know, a bad thing. Maybe you, this, um, you did lots of, you had lots of experience in the host country, um, but you're now going to be in a different region or you're now gonna be having new experiences in some other way. So don't worry if you don't meet these particular requirements. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how to frame it to support your project. So here's how the application pathway works. You apply through an institution. So in this case, you apply through Rutgers University graduate. And well, if you apply next year, for example, if I strongly recommend that very early on, you open the portal, you put yourself um, as a graduate and you double check, um, you email our grad fund email to make sure that you are um, in the portal correctly so that we can you know, help you troubleshoot. There isn't any last minute troubleshooting issues. Um, and basically you go through an in, in, there's an internal process that involves an interview and then there's a national process that um, is like broader, not specific to Rutgers, but a broader process um, from the IAE organization. So there are a few different kinds of awards that you can get. So one kind is a study research award. So this is a situation in which you do independent research or study projects. And in some cases you enroll in a graduate program in a host university, but that's pretty country specific and it also depends on the program. This, the goal of this is to both do your project and to promote mutual understanding among nation, so in this case, the US and your and the host country that you're going through, uh, or going to through engagement in the host com community and through doing all sorts of, you know, activities to basically not just do your project, but also get to know people and for people to get to know you. They also want to make sure that your project is of high quality. So it it's meaningful, it's interesting, and also that it's feasible. So you're gonna have you're gonna write a statement of grant purpose, which is basically a research statement, and they want to make sure that this is a project that can actually be done in the amount of time that you um, are allotted with this uh, fellowship, which is usually nine months. Although there are there is uh, 
it does vary a little bit by country. Um, but basically, you want you don't want to say, oh, you know, I'm undertaking a 10 year project and this is just going to be nine months of it. No, they want a project that you can do start, middle, end. The whole thing can happen in the time of the grant. And that can be part of your broader dissertation or um, it can be an independent project. But the idea is that you have some kind of cohesive whole. And the grant period usually corresponds to the academic country calendar of the host country. So usually you start sometime in the fall, usually September, but depending on the host country, it might be October or November. Um, and it usually goes until, you know, May, June, or sometimes July, depending on the host calendar, uh, host, host country's academic calendar. Um, okay, so another type of award is an English teaching assistant award. So this is an award in which you help teach English as a second language while serving as cultural ambassadors for the United States. So typically you'll assist local English teachers and provide um, kind of a presence of a native English speaker in the classroom. Um, this is also meant to promote mutual understanding. Do you see a trend here? The Fulbright is all about mutual understanding. Um, and again, you're going to be engaging with the host community and doing all sorts of activity. The host country placement is decided by the IAE. So you apply for a particular country and they will decide where in that country you're going to be doing your, um, your English teaching. And this is a really interesting experience if um, if you're interested in not necessarily doing research, but kind of getting to know another country, um, getting to know another culture, especially if you want to become a teacher, but also, you know, in many situations in your life, you're going to be interacting with people who have different backgrounds than you. Um, and you might be mentoring people, you might be teaching people, even if you're not a teacher. And so um, this is, this can be a really interesting opportunity. And there's one other type of award, which is a creative and performing arts award. So this is a situation, which, let's say you're doing a master's of fine arts or you are in some other way, um, you have like a, a creative endeavor that you're doing. So it's not research, you're not teaching, but you're gonna do some kind of creative endeavor. So in this situation, you submit a portfolio um, and also you submit, a, a description of what it is that you're going to be doing in the host country. So why do you want to go there? What kind of project do you want to do? So maybe if you're a filmmaker and you want to make some kind of interesting film, you know, with some collaborators in the host country, or maybe there are some other interesting collaborations that you want to do, or maybe you're um, a musician and you are really influenced by the host country's, you know, uh, traditional uh, folk music and you want to learn more about that and embed that into your compositions. There are lots of really interesting things that you can do. Um, and the details of what kinds of materials you need to submit are going to be dependent on your artistic field of study. So again, like if you're a filmmaker, if you're a painter, if you're a ceramicist, if you're a musician, you're going to have to submit different kinds of things. And you have to submit an arts experience summary and a, pro, a portfolio description. Um, so it explains like what it is that you do, what you've been doing, and to make sure that you, you know, you actually know your field and you're prepared to undertake this. So in terms of the stipend and benefits, so these are country specific, but you will get a monthly stipend for yourself. In some countries, there will also be stipends available for any dependents that you have. Um, but again, double check the country website and get information there. You'll get round trip travel between the US and the host country, and you will get health insurance. There are also other specifics. So in some countries, they'll be able to help you uh, get, um, uh, get housing. In some countries, they won't be able to help you get housing. So it is very dependent on the host country. Um, so in terms of the application, so first, there's some biographical data. So like, you know, who are you? When were you like, where, when were you born? Uh, where do you live? That kind of stuff. Um, there's some program information. Um, you su uh, submit a statement of grant purpose. So this is like, basically, um, if you're doing research, what research are you going to do? If you're teaching, what um, kind of more about how is your what kind of vision do you have for 
for teaching and what's your kind of vision about pedagogy. And if you're doing um, an, an arts-based application, then like what's the project, arts-based project that you wanna do? You're gonna submit three letters of recommendation. You submit um, a personal statement. So that's, you can think about that as a scholarly biography. So like, how did you become the researcher or potentially teacher or artist that you are? And also what have you done to prepare yourself to be successful in your project and in the host country? In most cases, um, not, so not if you're gonna be, uh, so for the, for the research or arts-based one, you have to submit an affiliation letter typically for the teaching one you don't. So that's basically like, let's say you're gonna do research um, in um, Belgium and you can, so you can submit a letter from say a host a university in Belgium or a professor in Belgium saying that they're, they will be able to host you at the university to do the research that you're doing there. Depending on the country requirements, you may have to submit language forms. So that's typically a language self-evaluation and an official language evaluation. And actually, um, I'm happy to talk more about that or you can come in for help with a funder meeting, but you can get those through the language programs at Rutgers. They will uh, typically help you with language evaluations. And you have to submit an unofficial transcript. So, this is what I was alluding to earlier. The deadlines are complicated. So this year, the campus deadline is actually today, um, which is the deadline that you need to engage in the internal process so, uh, of, of this interview. So you might be asking, why did we even tell you about this if the deadline is today? Well, for two reasons. First of all, I strongly suggest that if you, this is interesting to you, you keep it on your radar and you apply next year. Some of these awards um, you can do, the arts-based awards you can do once you've uh, graduated, but also if you're in a, say, three years master's program, or if you're gonna be starting a PhD after or something like that, then you can do it in the, um, in the last year of your program or in the, sorry, in the year after. Um, like if you apply next year, you can do the year after. Also, if you're really, really excited about this, you can try to, get it in for this year. Um, not obviously not for today, but you can email us um, and we can see if we can, you know, work something out and help you with the internal deadline. The national deadline is October 11th. So again, it's coming up very soon, but I strongly recommend that you especially keep it on your radar for next year. This is a really exciting and interesting award to get. Um, okay, so Tyler's going to talk about, so, you know, we talked about a bunch of different awards, but these aren't all the awards that are available. And uh, Tyler's gonna talk about how to find alternatives. Right, thanks for sticking with us. I know this is a long presentation and we have things to do on our day. So there's just a couple more sections we're gonna go through um, a bit more quickly. Um, this is a great resource um, that's available through Rutgers. It's a very expensive um, funding database that Rutgers subscribes to. It's called Pivot. So, um, Nama perhaps can place the uh, link in the chat for us in a second. Um, but it's a powerful funding database that's um, run and operated through ProQuest. So if you've ever done an article, I'm sure we've all come across ProQuest. They're kind of everywhere now in the academic landscape. Um, so this is one that's curated by um, them. So um, it has a kind of, slew of benefits one of them is an advanced search feature um, and you can really curate award lists that are geared towards your specific goals stage of study citizenship all of these types of things that will help uh, delimit your search results and really get you the funding um, that you're looking for it also has a feature that um, emails you weekly a set of awards that might be pertinent to your research interests or um, the type of awards you're looking for. So you can save searches and then um, ask Pivot to um, each week um, send you an email um, with new opportunities that fit into your search criteria. Um, and it also provides you with near-term and long-term planning. So you can save awards, you can flag them, um, you will get emailed when they change their deadline or have updated kind of solicitations. It anticipates, um, unlike many 
websites what the award deadline is going to be based off of previous years. So there's a lot of really good features here. And again, there's only so many of us at GradFund working on our own database that often um, hyperlinks or deadlines won't be updated, whereas there's a really huge team and, um, behind Pivot. Um, so we really encourage you to use this resource so that Rutgers keeps um, the subscription. And so just logging in, um, this page may have changed slightly, but you'll want to log in using your institutional um, login credentials, and you'll there'll be a drop down menu. You select Rutgers, and it will validate your profile um, or authenticate it through your uh, Net ID. Um, you can also um, view a recorded uh, GradFund webinar um, for a guide to how to use Pivot. If you schedule a planning meeting, we also walk you through um, how to use pivot um, so those are available for you um, and you should set up your pivot account and complete your profile and begin your search um, so when Nama's doing the next section I'll search for where that recording is um, and and put a link in the chat so I'm going to be talking about the grad fund canvas site um, and also um, just as a quick note um, I I know that Tyler said this earlier, but we're trying to answer your questions in the chat as fast as possible. Um, but I know that we're not quite getting to all of them. So um, we'll, you know, try to get to them at the end or try to get to them in, in process. Um, and also, of course, email us if we never get to them. So um, just so recently, um, we published a self paced guide to grants and fellowships in um, Envis, and I'll post that link in the chat. Um, and this is uh, pretty exciting, pretty useful, I think. Um, this is basically a Canvas website with um, information about what we've talked about, a lot of what we've talked about today. And it'll talk you through things like how to find things in Pivot. It'll, it talks you through, um, or there's information about say, um, what, how to basically, how to go through awards. So like how to write a research statement, um, how to um, write a personal statement, what other kinds of things to think about. Um, we put our webinar recordings up there. Um, and so you should check back there at some point. We'll probably have this one up, but we're, you know, trying to make sure that we support everyone with their application. So sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to get um, uh, things up there, but um, there's a ton of information there. Um, I posted the link in the chat. Uh, you just click on it, and I know it says enroll, but don't worry, it's not a course, it's totally free. Um, you just click enroll, and then you get access, and I strongly recommend it because it's a really good primer, and um, it helps you with things, um, especially as you're, say, preparing your materials, preparing for meetings, um, so it can be um, it can be super helpful, so I really recommend it. So when you log on, you'll see a page like this, which is like a general welcome page. Um, and then if you click on modules, and then it'll give you all of the many different options that we, uh, that we have in all the different areas. And keep checking back there. Um, we, we do update it and uh, there is lots more interesting stuff that's going to go on there, but there's already a ton of, ton of information. Um, and so it can be very helpful. Um, so in terms of next steps to think about, so again, get access to the Canvas site. Don't worry if it says enroll, it's not a course, it's totally free. It's, I think, very helpful. Set up a Pivot account, um, create your profile and get a few, start uh, performing some funding searches and you know, try to look uh, at broad things, try to look at narrow things um, or more narrowly in terms of keywords, you'll probably something that is interesting for you to apply for and to look into it. If you do find an award that you're interested in, um, talk with your advisor and also consider scheduling a help with a funder meeting. We're here, we're happy to help, um, and we like to support you along the process. We can give you lots of helpful information. Sometimes these awards are uh, difficult to navigate. Um, so thank you so much for sticking with us for this long. This has been a very long webinar, but um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there. So um, we're going to open it up to Q&A. You can write your question in the chat, but you can also uh, say it out loud. Um, we're, 
we're happy to answer everything. And if there's anything that for some reason we don't get to, or you're, you remember, you know, five minutes after the meeting happens, then please send us an email or book an additional meeting. Yeah, there's also, there was also a lot of chat I know during the, the webinar. So if we didn't respond to yours, would you mind just repasting it? Because even trying to scroll through these right now is a bit um, much. Or you can say it out loud. Yeah, I mean, Dan, I'm not sure the specifics of your questions, but yes, as long as you're a US citizen, um, there's not necessarily field restrictions. Um, however, it, there is a location restriction. So like, if you're a US citizen, typically you can't get a Fulbright to do research in the US, but right. if there's, there, you know, but maybe your research is like, um, Things that have like I don't know. Some people do things about say uh, U.S. No. soldiers abroad or something like that, and um, you can definitely do research about the U.S. Um, in you know archives somewhere else or in other locations. Right. So yeah, there's no there's there are Fulbrights to come to the U.S., um, but they are not for U.S. It's it's complicated, but basically. Um, uh, let's say you're Canadian, which I am, um, there's a Fulbright to come to do research in the United States, and you can enter the U.S. on that way for a graduate program. But if you're a U.S. citizen, unfortunately, there's not a Fulbright to do U.S.-based research or graduate study. Only but I do want to say there are awards for that. So definitely check out Pivot, um, you know, just because the Fulbright might not be the exact thing that you need doesn't mean that there aren't other things. You know, we only went through four awards. There are many other kinds of awards depending on what your program is um, and what your plans are and what your research is. So, you know, there are there are other things out there. Hi, it's Queenie. Hi, I just want to say this, honestly, um, webinar, honestly, like one of the best thing that ever happened to me, because one of my goal was to locate funding and why I'm doing this on my own and researching and the self guard um, scholarship help on campus I use it's really set the foundation. So I'm really, really thankful to you both for putting this together because honestly, I'm like going to, to my appointment with you guys and try to get some clarification with a lot of things that um, that these the foundational course on fellowship that you guys put on campus, it really set the tone. And I wanna say, this is just amazing. I'm going to be scheduling my appointment and you guys are gonna see me maybe like every once a month, <laughs> once a month. <laughs> So thank you. No problem. We're, we are really here for you that often too. <laughs> I know some um, people don't believe that, but many students in the School of Graduate Studies do off use our services, if not once a month or more, um, mm -hmm. to work on their applications. And you know, um, I'm glad I repasted the slides just in case anyone came in late and wasn't able to access them. But they're there for you to you know come back to to investigate these resources, as you said, the Canvas site, as you said. Um, pivot, I would also check out and um, anything that you find, and even if you have questions about, right, you can shoot us an email on fellowship underscore advisor at Rutgers grad, grad fund Rutgers edu, <laughs> or schedule a helpful defender meeting, right? So you have an award you want um, mm. to, uh, you have questions about, um, and you're not ready to work on the application yet, um, come to us, right? Um, there's really no kind of limits in terms of um, as long as it's external to Rutgers, we can help you with it. Will you guys consider other international fellowship? Like I know the, um, what was the Randall? I don't know, I'm pronouncing it wrong. The, what, the P, it starts with P, the foreign something for the US State Department. Um, the Randall, yeah. Are you guys familiar with that? Like other fellowship except that of like internal ones with Rutgers University. Yeah, we can definitely help you work on that. Um, I'm not 
recalling what award you're you're talking about yeah. but if you schedule help with a funder meeting and include the hyperlink um we can definitely walk you through that we okay. so for our meetings we prep for them um and that's why we take the two-day kind of advance notice to really um work through that and then kind of become an expert in it to answer any of your questions oh, okay fantastic so happy i attend um also i i just want to reiterate that it's really useful to come in um, earlier rather than later mm. because you know we can we can help with things we can help make sure that you like understand the award and also as you're working on your materials i've talked to many students and i've also been one of the students who <laughs> feel like oh no these awards are so hard i'm like writing i'm staring at a blank page i don't know if i'm going in the right direction i don't know if this is like what i need to do that's a great time to come, even though I think as graduate students, we often feel really nervous. What if it's not perfect? What if like, does this mean that I'm stupid or something like that? No, you're learning a whole new thing. You're like, it's a whole new process. And so I really recommend coming in early, even if you're stuck, even if you just have a really rough draft and you're like confused about whether it's going in the right direction, that's what we can help you with. We can, you know, either tell you, yeah, this is the total right direction, here are some tips, or we can say, mm, maybe you wanna shift a little bit in that direction, and then you'll you'll spend your time, you know, more wisely and more productively. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're really here to help. And you guys are fully open, right? I know with the whole COVID. So we are open, but our meetings are uh, staying virtual for at least okay. for this semester. Um, but we do have like a, I believe that we have meetings five days a week. Um, the earliest meeting in the day is at uh, 10 a.m. and the latest meeting starts at four. And so you you have a lot of options um, and you can book with, we have a few different um, peer mentors, uh, like there, of course, me and Tyler, but also there are a few other ones and you can book with anyone and, you know, we'll all, everybody that you book with will be, um, you know, fully versed in the award that you are applying for by the time you come to your meeting. And like, you know, we have uh, a team that kind of works together to make sure that you get very helpful and up-to-date advice, hopefully. Great. Um, and just, the our last meeting is 3 p.m. So just, just watch oh, that sorry, too. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> My bad. Um, any other questions? before we wrap up. And then we also able to do like events, like especially that of workshop and presentation on the website or like, do you guys have a like an upcoming event, especially workshop that's for so all better? I believe most of our workshops, so when you go to book a meeting, often there will be at the top like a banner that says like, oh, there's some upcoming workshops there, they're here. And typically we also circulate them um, through the department. So you can also get departmental emails about it. If for some reason you're, you know, looking for upcoming events and you don't see anything, then just send us a quick email to our um, grad fund email and we'll make sure that you have information about upcoming events. I just posted the link to of our fall workshop series. Oh, fantastic. So the same same process, you just register through the Rutgers Zoom links. Um, great. Any other questions or comments? No, for me, I'm just, I'm just so happy. Honestly, thank you guys. I'm Great. just, thank you. Bye. <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up there. I really appreciate everyone coming. Um, again, we're available um, to book appointments or if you have questions, follow up um, our email again. Um, we look forward to hearing from you and everyone have a great Thursday. Thank you. Bye.